Or as voters begin focusing on the upcoming presidential election in November, a new book is highlighting the path some presidents take after leaving the White House. Life After Power explores the post-presidency lives of seven of our nation's leaders and how they moved on after holding the most powerful office in the world. They include Thomas Jefferson, who went on to found the University of Virginia, John Quincy Adams, who served in Congress and became a leading abolitionist, and, of course, Jimmy Carter, who's had the longest post-presidency in American history, advancing humanitarian causes, human rights, and peace. And joining us now, the author of that book, Jared Cohen. Uh, Jared, let's start right there. Uh, congratulations on the book, but let's start with Jimmy Carter who it seems every step of the way in his post-presidency, he has been an example to the world. Uh, that's absolutely right, Mika, and thank you for having me. Look, Alexander Hamilton, you know, back in February 72, he asked the question, what should we do with our ex-presidents? And he wondered if it was a good idea for us to have half a dozen men who'd been elevated to the presidency wandering around us like discontented ghosts. And more than 200 years later with Jimmy Carter, we kind of have an answer to that question, which is former presidents <laughs> can either be tremendous partners to their successors or a huge nuisance. And Jimmy Carter has been both uh, to Democrats and Republicans alike. So, Jared, congrats on the book. Um, let's go through some of these. Let's talk about Grover Cleveland, who was a post-presidency twice because he uh, lost and then set out four years and then won again. So, obviously, we're seeing Donald Trump trying to mimic his behavior. But tell us more about him beyond the politics. What did he do after he left office? First of all, I love the fact that we get an occasion to talk about Grover Cleveland again. And, you know, I never would have thought when I began the journey writing this book that it would be newsworthy yeah. to write about Cleveland. But here we are. Um, the one and only time that you've had a rematch between two presidents as the nominees of uh, the two major parties was 1892. Grover Cleveland came back to challenge Benjamin Harrison. The difference is Cleveland never lost the popular vote. Um, he threw away the presidency in 1888 on a strong principle that he didn't want high tariffs, and he'd never been happier than when he left the president. He came back on the principle that he needed to save the economy from ruin, stop the tide of jingoism and imperialism. And it just shows you how off script that we've gone, that the only other time that we have a rematch between two presidents is you know, this election 2024. They're the two oldest candidates in history, eclipsed only by themselves four years ago. Herbert Hoover, history has stamped depression on his forehead. What did he do after he left office? Well, look, I'm on a mission to make Herbert Hoover great again. And the chapter in the book is called <laughs> Recovery. Um, and part of the reason it's called Recovery is, you know, Herbert Hoover lived to be 90 years old. He's defined by his four years in the White House. Before he was president, he was the great humanitarian who had fed the world after World War I. He was an orphan who rose to be a self-made millionaire. He led the relief efforts after the great Mississippi flood in 1927. At least I know you, you know that one well. And he waltzes into the White House in one of the most lopsided victories in history in 1928. And so he's just tarnished by the Great Depression. The FDR people really did a number on him. And Harry Truman resurrects him after FDR's death in 1945 because they both knew what it was like to live in FDR's shadow. But he resurrects him because there's only one man who knows what it's like to be president and how to feed the world. And they're staring the end of World War II in the face. And he asks Herbert Hoover to once again become the great humanitarian. He then becomes the great executive again, reorganizing the executive branch under both Truman and Eisenhower. And he finally achieves that bipartisan feat in 1960 when Joe Kennedy calls on him to reconcile John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon to show national unity amidst the Cold War. And so it's time to make Herbert Hoover great again. Jared, your book comes out mm -hmm. tomorrow, and it's gotten a rave review already from none other than Richard Norton Smith in the journal. So congratulations Thank on you. that. I'm really excited to read it. Um, my former colleague at the State Department back in the day in policy planning. Uh, but I want to ask you about Thomas Jefferson in this book. So founded UVA, pretty big post-presidency. But he faced an interesting situation there in 1825 with the version of, you know, social justice warriors back in the day. And can you talk about that? 
So it's interesting, you, you, you look at what's happening on university campuses today, and each chapter in the book looks at kind of a different model for how to answer the question of what's next. And Thomas Jefferson was kind of a serial founder. He didn't, he didn't want to be president. That was a founder's obligation since he co-founded the Republic. The third volume in his life trilogy was to find an arts and, found an arts and sciences university because he believed that the Republic was flawed and you needed a university to train the next generation. So October 4th, 1825, at 82 years old, the, you know, is the worst day in Thomas Jefferson's life. The students at his beloved UVA in the inaugural class are rioting throughout the university, covered in face masks, chanting down with European professors and throwing bags of urine at the administration. Um, so Jefferson calls an all-school assembly the next day for the students to meet before the disciplinary committee. That disciplinary committee was Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, the most intimidating disciplinary oh, committee, yeah. past, present, <laughs> and future. And the reason this is prescriptive for today, Jefferson stands up and he starts bawling, hysterically crying down his 82-year-old face. And he was a man who exuded such tremendous principle that when James Madison, all of five foot one, puts his hand on Jefferson's shoulder to sit down, the students are so distraught by seeing Thomas Jefferson emotionally tarnished by what they've done that the guilty confess one by one and they sort of abandon their sort of show of Southern honor where they won't give oh each other up. Oh, my God. Mm. What wow. a great story. This is great. The new book is entitled Life After Power, Seven Presidents and Their Search for Purpose Beyond the White House. It goes on sale tomorrow. Jared Cohen, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. Congratulations on the book. It looks great. Thank you for having me.